Hi, everyone. Uh, this is the last panel of the conference uh, narrating Cold Wars. Uh, it's going to be about uh, video games and also board games. Uh, so my name is uh, Minos Athanasios Kargiotakis. I'm a PhD candidate of the School of Communication and Film of Hong Kong Baptist University. And I'm very happy because today on my left side, as you can see on the screen, I have uh, our assistant professor, Matej Kovacic from uh, the Academy of Film, again, from the School of Communication and Film. So um, let's begin our presentation. Um, it's gonna be around uh, 15 to 20 minutes for its presenter. And then we are gonna have, uh, we are gonna try to have actually uh, questions. So if you have questions, uh, you can use the Q&A function, or if you are assigned as a panelist, you can use the chat box and send uh, your questions throughout the presentation. So uh, we begin by the first presenter. Uh, the name of the presentation is Cold War Once More, Reconstructing Cold War in the board game Twilight Strangle. And the presenter is Tian Xiao Peng. I hope that I'm pronouncing the name correctly. If it's wrong, please um, you know, take the initiative and correct me. And um, his research field has to do with uh, games of Chinese tradition the connection of the game world and the true world. And he is coming from uh, the Winchester School of Art, University of Southampton. So uh, the floor is yours. Because we are losing time. Oh, OK. Uh, so let, let, let's be quick. The title of this is Cold War was small. We can see Cold War in the ball game by West Jaco. So, First, a uh, very, uh, very quick outline of that. Uh, I would like to talk about that in the game of history, game of geopolitics, game of balancing, and the te uh, technological uh, uh, determinism tendency. And first, uh, this is some part of a review. Okay, time is quick. Uh, let, let's begin from this part, Twilight Struggle, the Cold War 1995 to, 19, to 1989. Let's, let me introduce the game Twilight Struggle. As we know, Twilight Struggle is an abstract. The full name of it, Twilight Struggle, the Cold War, as we know from the name, we can know that it is a game about the history of Cold War. This is a ball game when publishing. Then it was adapted into a digital game, and now it can be played on our personal computers. Play the game, two players are needed. One plays the role of the USSR, and the other plays the role of USA. What needs to be understood is players only play the role the superpowers themselves, not the specific leaders. In the 10 round game, each superpower would like to like the hegemony expand to all over the world, at the same time, stop the opponent from doing so. In order to achieve this goal, they must continue to expand their influence in Europe. Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Central America, and South America, weaken their opponents' influence and demonstrate their in international hegemony through cops, wars, space rights, and so on. Then I would like to talk about how does the game quite a struggle present the history of Cold War in certain perspectives, game of geopolitics, game of balancing, you know, the power of nuclear weapons and the technological determinant tendency. Okay, next slide. Let's talk about the game of geopolitics, omitted and merged countries. First, let's talk about the omitted and merged countries. It is complicated and unplayable for a game to reflect the, the real geological situation. You know, there are too many countries, too many regions. Let's talk about game. Therefore, Twilight Struggle merge and omit countries in regions creating their own world map. Yeah, a very small and very fragile one. For example, let's look at the picture. Beheim, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg are regarded as one country. You know, in the picture, it calls the Bernard Lux. Okay, the three countries have been omit and merged in one country. Moreover, in certain cases, such region division breaks the geographic boundaries. Taking Australia and Canada, for instance, among the oceanic countries, so only Australia has entered the 
territory of Australia struggle. Yet Australia is classified as an Asian country, not a Australia country, and Canada is classified as a Western European country instead of a North American country. Why did they do this? To make it a ball game. Okay, it's very specific. With such merch and amates, TS has successfully reduced the total number of countries in each of the regions, making the game playable. Rather than trying to conserve balancing like 50 countries in one continent. Imagine if the game production team put more than 200 countries in the region around the world into the game, what would happen? Maybe when they first saw this design, the player will say, whoa, it's awesome. But afterwards, most of the players will be frustrated about overly complex and huge mic and give up the game. They will be by the steam. Therefore, more importantly, considering the rule of the regional access, which will be introduced shortly, such cartographic design highlights the importance of geopolitics in Cold War, making the two superpowers combine with each other in few significant countries. Okay, next one, let's talk about the game of geopolitics on mixed agent countries. At the very beginning of the game, each of the players need to allocate their influence points to different regions, presenting influence, even control, toward the selected countries. Look at the picture. Now I am the player who plays the role of USSR, and I have six influence points in Angola. Therefore, I can expand my influence to Zaire, Botswana, or South Africa, because the Asian countries of Angola. Well, I'm not allowed to put my influence directly on Cameroon, Kenya, Zambia, or uh, Southeast African states because I have no influence in any countries there or any countries agent there. After them, besides certain events, players can only cast their influence in a country which is agent to the country that player has already have influence. You know, therefore, the geopolitical significance of one country or region not only lies in itself, more importantly, it serves as a conduit for support power to other countries or regions. Therefore, controlling a country can mainly be attributed to geopolitical influence, which reason being geopolitical considerations, such as balancing the component or reinforce the country of region. Next one of theme of geopolitical that's approach to a region. Approach to a region, how to think about this? It's another feature of the game design related to cartography. You know, in the real history, if you would like to put your influence from that, uh, just uh, take on the airplane and some, some military and uh, some more people. But no, in the boss game, it's different. In this case, look at the Columbia, uh, not very big. I think you can see that. The Columbia would be the prime demonstration. Look at the picture. The Columbia serves as the only link between South America and Central America, which is the stability number is only one. Uh, okay, uh, only one. So the government uh, is weak. And therefore, from a geopolitical standpoint, the USA can run its own political as more readily in Central and South America than the USSR. You know, in the Panama, and there is a blue influence. Uh, the blue is for the USA, and the red is for USSR. The USA also would hand over control of Colombia to USSR, making Colombia a major battlefield in the middle of to later stage of the game. So, although it's a non battle ground country. Then let's go to a very exciting and uh, very awesome thing. Yeah, all people uh, would like to know about that, but are scared of that, the nuclear wreck. In Twilight Struggle, the status of the nuclear crisis is indicated by DEFCON level. 
see that the death con details in real history. This is the genetic witness goal used by the US military. The goal is divided into five levels. That confines them for the peace, and the peace, no restrictions. And then from peace to the world, the restrictions will be more and more. And the worst death. DEFCON 1 means nuclear war is imminent or has already started. It's horrible. However, this is a historical game, after all, not a science fiction game. Therefore, the power of nuclear weapons lies not, on, not in their destroy, but in their deterrence. You know? The rule of the game states that a player may also when the instance they often cause the DEFCON level to reach one. You, uh, you know, if your opponent lights the nuclear war begin and you win, because you are the one who keep the peace. <sighs> However, um, the, trial the trial struggle causes the players to rethink their playing experience and the context of possibility of nuclear warfare. Therefore, another of the Cold War can be found in the analysis of the game from the perspective in nuclear war. It is a dedicated history of balancing, balancing the conflicts of the two superpowers and actual domestic and the global nuclear war. Okay, let's be quick. The next part is the, te the technology determines them tendency. Mm. Now the example is the space race. Space race is a part of the Cold War. It is also has been present in Twilight Struggle. In this game, there are eight steps of space race. When a player as the superpower launched its first man-made Earth satellite, it takes the first step in the space race in the Cold War. And the building of space situation is the highest achievement can be got for the state one, three, five, and seven, and the superpower can get some victory points. For the step two, four, six, uh, and less, the superpower can get some indirect advantages in the competition. In general, a superpower can only do one space right per round. Overall, this game is weakly technically deterministic. Although the development of aerospace technology and space competition can give players a certain degree of advantage, they are far from enough to directly win. We know the space ring has promoted scientific and technology breakthroughs in real history and has also provided certain concerns for the development of the military in in industry. But during the Cold War, the space race did not really play a pretty role on the battlefield. The same is true in the game. To win the game, you need to be 20 points ahead of your opponent. However, in the space race, even you pay a lot of price, a lot of energy, you can only get four points at a time when you reach the final step and establish a space situation, which is far from victory. Now is the final part, the conclusion. By the deconstruction and analysis of the rule and the gameplay of the game quite a struggle, this research finds out that as a designer suggested that the Cold War is the superpowers to spread their ideology and culture around the globe. The game portrays the Cold War as a competition as geopolitics, a balancing experience of the conflicts of two superpowers and the actual doomsday of a global nuclear war, and partly, and partly a technological determination installation. Okay, the final part. This game shows the possibility of presenting the history of the Cold War. Although the presenting is obviously a generalization and reinterpretation of real story. In addition, the game rules and the de 
design of the game card also give the code work history a variety of possibility. As Ruth thing signs, yeah, just look at that side. We can never really know the path, but can clearly play ways we cop for and try to make many out of the trace it has left behind. And the ability side to understand the past as something cruel and constrict. Thank you. That's all of my presentation. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Indeed, uh, studying board games is uh, quite uh, unique. Uh, so let's move with our uh, second uh, presenter, um, Ju Jishuan. He is a second year PhD student in the School of Communication uh, of Hong Kong uh, Baptist University. And his presentation is going to be about uh, the Cold War cognition and gratification in Chinese war games, the Chinese version of combat Command, sorry, and conquer red alert video. So, two, sorry, that was Greek. Uh, so, uh, we are gonna uh, see the presentation of uh, Zisuan, but during the presentation, you can always ask uh, questions in order to have uh, on the chat box in order to have um, a fruitful uh, dialogue after the end of his presentation with both of the presenters. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Maybe let the right? Yeah. And, and then I'm just Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhu Zixuan from Hong Kong Baptist University, and I'm delighted today that I have a chance to share my research with you. And my research is about the Cold War cognition and the gratification in Chinese war games. And I'm going mainly focusing on this case. It's Command and Conquer 2, Red Alert, a uh, Command and Conquer, Red Alert 2. It has an American game, but has very popular Chinese versions. Uh, so uh, firstly, uh, uh, we need a brief introduction uh, to the game. And Command and Conquer is a real-time strategy video game franchise. Uh, first developed by Westwood Studios. It is a simulation game of a modern war. And in particular, Red Alert 2 is about a virtual hard war in the Cold War discourse between the US camp and the USSR camp. So in short, it is just what really happened. So the gameplay follows the classic real-time real strategy video game design. So players command an army fighting against the opponent from the God's will and it features research gathering. So in game, we build miners and collect gold mile and capture all the drakes. And base building is like a war factory and in-game technological development and indirect control of units. This means you need to command your soldiers and tanks in the map. And why Red Alert 2 is essential? So I'm gonna say that this is a representation of the Cold War and also a simulation about the war under the Cold War political conflict. And second, it is a commercially successful game in the US. And though it is an American game, one of the Chinese modified version of uh, Red Alert 2, the title is uh, The Glory of the Republic, which is in 2001, achieved great popularity that almost all internet bars in China is through it, and mainly through private copies actually on their computers. As a result, it proved far more popular among the Chinese gamers than the original one in the, US, uh, in the US game in the West. Uh, in the original American version, China is not a selectable country, but in the Chinese version, China is becoming a new power that does not, does not belong to any camp, while it's also being too powerful to maintain the game's balance. So actually, uh, the two versions provide us a valuable case. And this game is nearly no attention to the academic, especially in mainland China, but its topic and popularity indicating that it is worth more studies. And my research is focusing on these three questions. So what is the difference between the original American version and the Chinese modified version? What can those tell us? And why does this game simulating war in this particular way? And how does these two versions of games shape the collective idea of players? 
and are games indicating the social and political change in our society. So first we're gonna take the American version. And in the American version, the Soviet starts a war to invade the US, of course. And the Allied units is, is portrayed as a high tech, fast, but fragile with, low, with fewer health points. And however, the Soviet units is sturdy and frightening in the art design, but have more health points and are full of internal suspicion in the storyline. And moreover, the original game explained the communist ideology as underpinned by mind control technology developed by the Soviets. So it simplifies the communist ideology. Uh, so this character on the right named Yuri, is one of the Soviets who can control people's minds. The prototype of this character is coming from like Wolf Messing, uh, who is a famous Russian psychic. And the appearance of him is based on Lenin. And here is a clip from the casting of the game. And so this is the part that the player will see when we are on the allied side. The officer will introduce Yuri to you. Okay. And in short order, we will all, young and old, pledge allegiance to our new leader, Premier Romanov of the USSR. Commander. <laughs> Your performance in Colorado was pretty darn impressive. But things have changed since you've been away fighting. The war is over. What I've come to realize is that the commies and us want the same things. You know, female I don't think we need to hear any more of that. State. First that the president and even General Carville are under the influence of a Soviet psychic mind control device developed by this man. This is Yuri. Our intelligence sources now believe that Yuri and his psychic core are the ones responsible for Asian. Right now, the Soviets control much of the population in the area. Okay, and so this clip is what we are playing as a Soviet size, and Yuri is going to introduce himself. I think it is time we had a talk, you and I. When the Soviet Union was new, there were those of us that Stalin turned to for our particular skills. We were trained to turn men's minds to our will. This is Stalin's psychic legacy. I tell you this because you are too smart not to be curious. We have a situation that odd little man Einstein has provided the Allies with a device that harnesses the energy from storm clouds overhead. Almost whimsical but effective. Destroy this device with the nuclear missiles I will provide you and get our forces moving again. Okay, so what the Chinese version uh, provide us? Uh, comparatively in the Chinese version, China was incorporated into the game and portrayed as a new superpower, more powerful than the US and the USSR. And more significantly, China has solely troops and combine the Western high-tech weapons with the Soviet heavy industrialized weaponry. Uh, this uh, unit here on the screen is called China People's Liberation Army Soldier in the game. Its unit is more powerful than the soldier in the, in, of the Allied or the Soviet camp. So it's adapt the benefit of both sides and follow a very clear strategy. And more importantly, in the year 2000, the American rating system gave this game a uh, teenager rank, which means that player have to be about 13 years old to play it. But however, in the Chinese market, we are primitive that time during the period, so it is no rating system. Therefore, many children will edge this game since the Chinese version is not actually encrypted. So why the example is me, is this game is very popular in my community when I was eight years old and I played it. So the game design provides an authentic immersion in the period. And uh, you probably still remember this photo from the cutscene. Uh, it's actually modified from the photo of Stalin and Lenin. But in the context of China in, two, in the year 2000, the photo modified technology is really not well known. So this photo has actually shocked my father for a minute to tell me that it's a fake one. And what is the Chinese uh, developer's intention? Uh, I'm gonna argue that this radical concept 
about the Chinese version shows that the developer's clear ideal regarding to the future of China, namely combine the high tech from the Western weapon and the sturdy Soviet weaponry and the system substantially emerge as a significant global power. And young players uh, were exposed to this game before receiving any education about Cold War, meaning that the game shaped their initial perspective understanding and actually put China into the Cold War discourse as opponent of the US. And moreover, its popularity partially confirmed that this reflecting a collective ideal that Chinese use. Ultimately, the confrontation between China and West may have boosted the game's popularity while radically simplified the Southern Western relationship. And a possibly accepted argument is that game carries rhetoric and ideology which deeply affected players, you know, according to the social learning theory we know, and as well as the ludology study field. Capillo and Elliot argues that war games, especially those representing historical change, may alter the contemporary understanding of history. And so in the political discourse, and war games are, are now recently critical development uh, in the political discourse. And you still remember this photo case and has another adopt in the American internet space. So it's like this. Uh, it's indicating that Bernie Sanders is one of the comrades of Yuri who can control people's mind to attack him as a socialism. And in the Chinese context, during the 2001 Zhengzhou flood, the Chinese political scholar called Jin Cairong have claimed that the US had used a Western weapon against China to curse that disaster. Uh, of course, his claim was wildly criticizing by the Chinese, uh, Chinese people. And one of the famous comments on his Weibo is, Jin play too much red or two. And if you still remember, this, uh, this weather weapon uh, was used in red or two that Yuri introduced to us. And moreover, like um, war games and war simulations today have been treated extremely serious by governments, already influencing the US government decision making. And I'm sure it's not only the US government. And the war games and data analysis are vital for predicting international relationship and politics. So in this article on science, they're saying that's this new generation of war game. And more significantly, this game partially predicting the Chinese diplomatic relations. Over the past two decades, Chinese policy is accurate through the game's concept. The game provides an illusion of the role that China will play in the post-Cold War political contest. So if you still remember, China combined the Western high tech with the Soviet industrialized system. Actually, the system now is not only industrial system, but also the political system in a way. And being a new superpower, more powerful than both the US and the USSR. So is that what happening? This we just see in the previous two decades. I'm not sure about it, but this uh, interesting issue. And this song called Soviet March, it's, uh, it's, it's from uh, Red Alert 3. It's released in eight years after the Red Alert 2. It might become uh, evident to prove there is a change. This actually, uh, the British artist in the American company made this song as a sarcasm towards the Soviet ideology in the game. This song was actually writing the style of German music, indicating that uh, the Soviet aimed to rule the world. So, I will give you an example here. Oh, sorry. I think it's enough for it. So, uh, 
But in the internet space, actually the Russians and Chinese really admire this song. It even become a background music of a TV series made in by Chinese Central Television. So this song was used to prize the spirit of leaders of the Chinese village in the early 1950s. So the soul sarcasm actually turned into a courage or we say uh, acceptance in that contest. Uh, you probably have a feeling of it. Uh, okay. Okay, as for the time interest, we don't, we, I don't want to continue this. So in conclusion, what does the original American version tell us? It is a clear of the American er, uh, version of the game. It has the legitimacy of the Western democracy and actually simply satirize the Soviets. But as a, I think the Chinese version show more significant message to us than the original version. So first this thing is, is, is shaping thousands of Chinese gamers' opinions in the Cold War and actually simplify the Chinese-US relationship. And hinting in the game is that the role China will play in the post-Cold War political contest is actually coming true, and as, at least in some extent. And it's can a collective coordination in the Chinese players, which may predict the Chinese policy in a way. So uh, finally, in conclusion, we may say that, you know, the ones of the US-Chinese conflict getting exciting today the entertainment fun made version of a war game from year 2000 indicating that tension. It's not only a representation, but a simulation of a Cold War in the post Cold War era. Players are not only playing, but they are simulating that kind of conflict every day. Uh, Cold War today is shaping our understanding of historical events, political ideas, and also involved in vital political and military decision making. I'm going to say that uh, those events of full commercial war games is not only entertainment, but media simulations whose voice is scouting louder and louder in our society and our political discourse. And it's actually worth more study. And yeah, that's basically my research about it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Jishuan, for uh, your uh, presentation that uh, has to do with a topic uh, that actually has become uh, quite well known the last, I think, decade, uh, considering the video games and how they shape, uh, you know, probably young generation, because usually the young generation, uh, you know, plays more video game. Uh, I have uh, several questions for uh, the two presenters, but... Um, uh, since we don't have questions in uh, the Q&A box or the chat box, uh, I want to ask if there is anyone else from the audience that actually wants to, to make a question. Okay, we have uh, one, uh, Professor Kenny. Uh, the floor is yours. You can ask your question. Yeah, I think I have two questions uh, for this one, but also for both speakers. I think one is about uh, war games being uh, viable propaganda. Uh, using the legacy of Cold War, how to what extent do you think is the propaganda, or there are some other functions? As the first speaker mentioned, the understanding of different parts are, are there a variety, a spectrum of this uh, functioning, the functioning, how, how these war games function in your experience of your research? And the find is actually, you know, propaganda is a very uh, effective way. <laughs> Doing more, more game. Uh, and how would you compare with cinema? Okay, in, in our old age, or we all say cinema is a mass mobilizing vehicle. Right now, it seems uh, games. Right? Uh, and the second, I think, is a little bit more intriguing uh, for me is about uh, simulation, right? simulating experience. I want to talk about experience. And of course, war games is not about war, but 
uh, what about, I think what is interesting about Cold War is like um, ambiguity or the, the danger of being trans, uh, moving from Cold War to the Hot War. Right? It's always even at, at the right time, right now we are actually under the threat of the Hot War, whereas uh, we are using the Cold War and uh, drawing up a lot of the lessons or the, the kind of uh, anxiety or alerts, et cetera, and et cetera. So, when I talk about the simulation, these war games, you we talk about the strategies. Uh, it is not just about games, it is about simulating real real world strategies. Okay, so uh, how 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 close is it is it doing this? Uh, do you think uh, simulating experience uh, actually which is far removed from being a real hot war, right? Uh, even the war that the 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 cinema war movie we just had right now a. Uh, China, we have uh, uh, claiming to be the uh, highest grossing film in world cinema, which is the war of the Changjin uh, Rift, right? Uh, it's being played right now in Hong Kong. So, so, how would you, uh, you and both speakers, respond to these questions? The propaganda and the experience. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the burning question. And for the first one, I think it's, I, I really like. Uh, in my research, I saw a lot of like a type of war games that we just board games and other uh, different genre of games indicating the the, uh, the uh, Cold War discourse. And I saw what's interesting is like uh, they were they were uh, of course they have the message of propaganda is hiding in the game design. So as uh, we say, the Allied have a strategy and the Soviet have the strategy. They always portray the uh, most of the American because they are mostly original from the Americans, they put it that uh, the Allied is like justice or something. You cannot use like dirty strategy, something like that. But for the Soviet, you're probably using like the dirty strategy. And one thing is important is convey like the Soviet have like a lot of internal suspicion. They're always like uh, gonna attack themselves, something like that. And I think uh, in this game, I think why I choose this is, I think it's like more straightforward and they have two versions. So, so we can see how the propaganda working and how actually the propaganda is reversed in different contexts. And I, I really believe that uh, uh, the game itself is like, they're just stating your past. The past is not like, a, a giving you like an illusion of freedom. It's like, a, it's not like what, what is I'm watching a film. And it's just like, you're, you're doing this, but all your, 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 your action is going to toward like something others are already designed. But I'm not saying all the war games, but a lot of like the Cold War games is follow this pattern. And I think it's, I think probably another thing is we can, uh, I, I see some reading about uh, the, 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 the war game. It's like, if we say cinema, cinema is like, uh, you, you have like a cinema time is different. So you probably say like the Battle of Lake Changjing is happening in, in about uh, 19, some 1950s, some year. But in a game, it's whole, the time is whole like uh, pressing to one. And for example, if you play this game, I ask you, uh, when did you conquer the Soviet? You're gonna tell me like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's the whole game. The whole time since it's changes, I'm doing this. But I think that's the way is how they give you the impression of how these things. And the second question you ask, I think it's how this working today. It's, uh, I'm reading some article they're saying like they were doing the same thing. It's, of course, it's more, more accurate, more uh, simulation, more a lot of like mathematics, but it's uh, how the commander doing their really real, real like decision making, how to uh, command their armies. There's through like you know, it's like a, a simulation uh, board and to command their army to some place. Uh, actually, the U.S. I think they were, they were using like some uh, simulation, very accurate, but not like this is like a really commercial thing. But they were actually using that to 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 predict that if I do this, what China gonna respond is something like that. So the, so the whole thing is like, actually it's appearance this difference, this uh, we are playing this is something really not serious, but that one is like some very high tech things, but the essence of it is same. So if like they were doing some uh, political or decision making through that way, so the same there we are like players who doing this way, it's working the same way. And, uh, of course, and what they were doing there, actually it's a top secret for, for every nation. They, they needed to keep it secret. So I think the, what here is telling me it's like, the Wolves actually play a lot of roles that is 
really there's not such difference. It's like what we are doing here is what they were doing in their secret room. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Uh, Tian Xiao, do you want to answer to the second question? Uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, just ask. If, if, if I may uh, add, you know, another perspective of Professor Kenny's question, you can adjust the question also to the board games because we are talking about the same thing. So uh, how is it working, you know, in the video games and also in, in the board games from your uh, perspective, the narratives? Uh, sorry, can you pardon? How, how the narratives construct, you know, specific thinking in, in the mind of the players? Both, you know, Professor Kenny asked about video games, but uh, probably because in your case you are uh, dealing with a board game, uh, you can tell us more, you know, about the board games, how the board games do that. Um, well, uh, okay, let me give a, a perspective of, about that. I'm not sure whether uh, it, it, it comfortable. So, you know, in the in board game Twilight Struggle, there are two superpowers, uh, one is USSR, one is USA. But let's pay attention to the game designer team. What is the position of the game design, designer team? Okay, uh, before we know that, maybe maybe we can have an image, imagine that uh, it's not is not in the position of the USSR, is and is not in the position of USA. Uh, maybe it's an, in a natural position. But uh, after my observation, no, it's not in the natural position. It's a uh, American game designer team and it's in the position of America. Why I say this? Because we call the period Cold War. But in that period, there is not only cold war, but also some hot wars. Uh, how many hot wars in the period from 1943 to uh, 1989? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, almost I think it's more than 10 hot wars. Okay, and in, and how many hot wars in this board game? Okay, I can tell you there are five hot wars. Uh, which five is in Pakistan? Is Pakistan is three uh, is uh, Iran, Iraq and uh, and uh, is uh, called a brush war. You know the brush brush war is not a war. It certainly happens somewhere. It's, it can hot, it, it can happen anywhere. It's only called brush war. It's a it's card in this game. But all of the war uh, can be called caused by neutral in, in this. In this game, by neutral, it means uh, not only the USA, but also the USSR can begin the war, or by the USSR. So there is no any kind of hot war uh, is, decide, is decided and must be caused by the USA. Really? It's suitable for the um, real history? We know it, it, it's not until the until the Paris peace assigns, uh, you know, the ending of the Vietnam War in 19, 1973, the Vietnam War has continued more, more than 10 years. It's really long. And who has begun that? It's the USA. But this very important war, it has not been represented in the card game Twilight Struggle. Uh, there is only one only one card which is about Vietnam, the country is about the Vietnam revolts, which much more is much earlier than the Vietnam War, the very significant war. Yeah, that's an example for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that wants to ask questions? Otherwise, I will go ahead with my questions. Uh, okay, uh, the first question. Uh, actually aligns with uh, the discussion uh, that uh, with uh, uh, Chuan we had uh, about, you know, what he said about the United States of America, uh, because there were rumors that, for example, specific video games uh, like the series of Call of Duty were actually used uh, for recruiting uh, capable uh, soldiers, uh, you know, by seeing how they were interacting. And there were rumors even, uh, I don't know if it's a fact, that's why I say rumors, that even the United States of America actually was working with a company in order to make the game more real 
and they can understand, uh, you know, better real life simulation of, of a war. So the question is, why uh, Commander Cockwell uh, led that at the uh, for, uh, two? Sorry, because I used to play the game in Greek. Sorry, that's that's why two uh, is uh, you know the in in Greek. That's why I'm saying it. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. So the question is why that specific title? And for example, um, you know, not not other titles that they have become very very prominent. Like for example, I know Call of Duty. Okay, Counter Strike is very well known, but it. It's not so much with Cold War, right? But why that specific title, except, you know, your justification that actually it became popular in, uh, you know, in, uh, in China, in the mainland? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about the title. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically, I mean, they're, they're trying to convey it a very, like, smart way, I think. Red alert itself it means, like, you're really attention, you're really in attention, we're going to have a war or something. But actually, they, I think the game designer using the red alert to indicate you know, that the Soviet or the communist is, like, goes coming to us. They are trying mm -hmm. to indicate you know, this uh, idea. It's like, we, we're going to defend you in the American original one. Yeah, so that's why it's in the Chinese version. It's like they just they, they were trying to re re reverse this, like call it like the glory of the republic. They, they just the Chinese name, but of course the red alert is there because you, you cannot just erase it. But in the Chinese, they, they reverse it in a way. It's like a glory of the republic. Actually, that's not only only modified version. This this is another <laughs> more radical. I don't want to introduce that as it to you. So in a way, in America, they're saying. They use the word a, a rat, uh, trying to, in a way, like the Soviet, mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, it's not going to be a compromise, you know, it's, it's just like very conflict thing. Yeah. And in Chinese, they're just trying to make it. Yeah. That's what my answer okay. Thank you for your uh, answer. Uh, Tian Xiao, actually, I wanted to ask you a similar question uh, because I know, again, many board games, right? That they are. I think at least far more popular than Twilight Struggle. Uh, why did you choose, uh, you know, that specific board game and not another one that it's, you know, far more popular? Again, you know, board game that has to do with strategic decisions, right? The same genre. Why not something else? Yeah, why I mean, okay, okay. Why I choose Twilight Struggle, not uh, any other games? Oh, okay. I, I think there are uh, three reasons. I uh, hope I hope the three reasons can be useful. Uh, the first is that uh, this material. I mean, this this ball game. I'm I'm familiar with. Yeah, I have already familiar with the game game class struggle, and then I found there is a meeting. So I I, I think okay, that's useful. I can write an article or. Uh, abstract of article to do that. That's the first. The second is about uh, uh, is about that this this game is pay attention to the whole period of the Cold War. It's not a uh, only part of that. You know there are a lot of uh, board game or digital game video games are about the period of Cold War. People can, oh, can also play the role as the USSR the like, the United States uh, America or uh, play the Chinese, uh, play as the role of China. Okay, but they only a part of this. For example, uh, if you are would like to lead or guidance an army to do that, it's a very small part of that. But for the game, uh, Twilight Struggle, uh, it cannot give too much detail. You know, any kind of event or any kind of war is just one card. When somebody play one card, uh, it's only a change in one country or or player dice or let the operation use. But I can give it in a in a whole. It's really all over the world. My view is globally. Yeah, I, I can use the view globally. So I use that. And there is a third reason. The third reason is that it has been a very famous uh, in the field of board game it has been to the top one, not only the top one of the Cold War board game, but the Cold War of all the, the board game is 11 years ago. Yeah, it's an old game. And then 
in several years ago, it had been changed into a video game. It had changed from, from a very famous and well-known board game to a video game. So I think that's very interesting. And then I will do future research about, about that to explore more about how should uh, how should I and how should a bot, bot game change and if we played it by our personal computers and by you know uh, the digital approaches is that the same reflecting of the, the cold war the signal from what what it was in bot game or not thank you uh, thank you so much uh, about your answer actually uh that way i was surprised with your presentation i didn't know that there was you know a board game because uh, i have played and i knew the video game but not uh, the board game uh, so thanks uh, again so um is there anyone else oh uh, we have uh, uh professor matega that wants uh, to ask uh, a question so we yeah, have for yours okay thank you thank you for both presentations um and um, i have a question or a kind of opening up question for for both speakers uh, games are a form of popular culture and cultural production but we have also seen in both presentations of production of knowledge uh, intellectual production that means in terms of history especially and the cold war specifically and in both your research and also you have shown so uh, interesting, uh, in, interestingly, Tian Xiaoping has shown in, in, in board games, the plurality of past and constant playing with the past, which is wonderful because uh, games as the, and play as the third space, um, as, as defined by uh, John Huizinga, who wrote about plays and games, uh, creates that alternative space for reimagining the past, present, and the future. And this is what comes through in Zhu Zixuan's presentation as a form of reimagining futures, uh, especially of China in the way that the uh, games are translated from one national context to another. So my question would be, in both your researches, how do you see and how do you situate games and their significance, and especially with the continuous rise and proliferation of video games um, and different kinds of games, how do you see the significance of games in the production of knowledge? Okay, I, I, I probably answer it first. Yeah, I think there's a kind of argument that uh, games could be like an education tour. And actually, uh, as I know, is uh, there's a game called This War of Minds made in by, I think, po po Polish game developers. It's actually the game has been added to like a, a high school recommend rating. So they're indicating that this game is going to work in like a really classical education material for the high school student to understand what is happening in the history or what is the feeling in the world. So I think that is the example for us how game gonna educate, become education tour. Of course, there's some more uh, simple way. I think Tencent is trying to make in this uh, idea saying that uh, I'm gonna develop a game to, to educate the, the Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese uh, students in a way, but actually, some, some some question comes actually because they are questioning that the citizen trying to get away of the, the, the censorship. So it's just a, trying to perceive it as like a, a education tour. But I think it's uh, no doubt that game carrying some, uh, I think some scholars saying this like a uh, procedural rhetoric. So you're seeing you're in the procedure and you're actually accepting the rhetoric about what happening in the history and what the educator wants to know and you're gonna, feel it's more like what you're really doing. So I think the yeah, game is a way to, to educate and to convey ideas uh, in this way of definitely, yeah. And I think there's a lot of uh, examples is there as emerging and uh, I really want to see as one of the even a game gonna
become a chance tool in our in Chinese as uh, like a recommending rating for schools. That's going to be a further steps, and actually it's already happening in some country. Yeah. Can I just briefly follow up on that? I was also including into that uh, the popular unofficial knowledge production, non-institutional knowledge production, right. because popular culture is the site where you have plurality, diversity, and multiplicity of voices. Popular culture can be manipulated, as you've both shown. Popular culture can be used for various agendas, economic, political, uh, and so on. But it is also a site that is unpredictable, uh, escapes control very often. So it is a site of alternative ways of producing knowledge as well. So out all educational part, you've, you've answered that really nicely. Thank you. The, the institutional part, but also uh, popular knowledge, unofficial knowledge, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I, thank you for mentioning that. I think it's, yes, I mean, today it's, uh, uh, in game, I think we are, it, it, it's like a way to uh, promoting uh, popular culture education in a way. So uh, actually, I think game, indicating an idea about eco and we can share our uh, I think it's uh, I think it's the same idea as uh, in avatar study in game so actually in games uh, today's game we are we are, we are always uh, in a way uh, not always most of the time have avatar in your game so it could be a dinosaur or could be a, a car could be a, some uh, some person you choose whatever is choosing by the player himself. So and indicating an idea that our body is not uh, whatever our joint, our uh, races, our uh, uh, skin color is not important because they always portray like, like something you want in the game space. So in that way, and I noticed uh, it's really uh, in a way, and I'm going to say like today, it's like a game is really not a very expensive thing. Anyone in the world, you, you're probably receiving a game that's just not need to pay a lot of money. And actually, some of the, some of the game developers allow to, to 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 some people to just get it for free. Uh, so I think it's a way to we say uh, education in that way doesn't need to any institution or any mm -hmm. uh, uh, we say uh, like a university. And if, and it's also a way we say game actually is happening recently in China. It's like a, uh, because the whole. At that time, I mean, when I was a boy, it's, a game is not like a officially uh, input in China, so everyone's searching for the, the private copies. And that way, it's your, I'm not saying it's the right thing, but it's that way, it's how people are receiving some education or something. It's not, even not have to like officially accept it. For example, like the, the, the game actually is coming into China like officially really, really late, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jian Xiao, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, yeah, very good question. I would like to talk about this. Uh, this is not, not, not only about board game, digital game, uh, digital game or video game, but it's also about the popular uh, culture and how we should do the agent the agent setting. Uh, you know, uh, after what the next man had got the theory of uh, agent setting, it had been several, too much years. But all of scholars pay attention to that. I think because it's really important, we really need to pay attention to that. A lot of media can have their role and pay attention to that. And games, uh, no matter which kind of game, is also a kind of new media. In the last century, for example, in the period of the Cold War, people think, oh, game is only it's only game. We don't need to do much about that. But in this century, in the first, in the twenty-first century, the effecting of games uh, is really is really challenging, and the people cannot ignore the effecting of game. So why the game is so pop? Uh, that is so important in the field in the circle of popular culture because. What is the target of game? The target of the, the game is aimed to absorb people. It's aimed to let more and more people take part in that, let pe people play the, the game, play, play, and play. It's no ending. Uh, it, no ending is the best. And it can also be used in the field of 
in the field of uh, knowledge uh, and and uh, like he, he said in the field of education now i have know that in some university like the peking normal university and in some company like the studio called uh, the tencent nice studio uh, i have talked about uh game designer in the tencent nice studio we, uh, we have talked about this in the field we can in in the period we cannot reflect in the whole the real detailed history because it's too long. People don't have enough interesting enough time and energy to know the whole history. So how should people know the history? People know the history from some parts, uh, like the Twilight Struggle is one is one of of the parts and other and other video games. So it. Maybe sometimes, uh, sometimes later in a video, video game, the US, USA is evil. Oh, the people really think it's evil. Or the USA is fair, the people really think uh, it is it's fire. So uh, we, we should do more, uh, not only for the people, for, for our scholarly self, uh, and uh, not only for ourselves or for the government, for the society, Society and other organizations, they need to do more to create to create more video games and board games, or get corporate with the game designers to write my own history. If we don't write our my own history, and others or opponents or maybe uh, you, you know others will write their own history, and the history can be changed. Yeah, that's what I see. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so uh, I see that we have no uh, other questions. Uh, so because it's uh, the last panel of uh, narrating Paul Words, I have the privilege to ask Professor Kenneth uh, Paul Tan uh, to give uh, the closing remarks. So Professor, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> so we've, we've really come to the end of a day of very, very impressive uh, papers given by, I think, more than 20, 25, maybe, uh, students who beamed into Hong Kong from all over the world. Um, so I want to thank them all for really impressive, really thoughtful, uh, interesting and certainly important papers. Thank you very much for that. I also want to thank our graduate students from the Baptist University for chairing these sessions so wonderfully, uh, so patiently and so, so um, uh, uh, productively. Yeah? Thank you for, for managing these panels so well. I especially want to thank my colleague, Mat Matea Kovacic for being here throughout, right from the early hours of the morning, right until the very end, and uh, for being such a nurturing presence here, giving questions, uh, feedback, uh, guidance, and encouragement. That was extremely uh, valuable for us. We're very, very grateful for, for that. Thank you. Uh, we've also come to the end of three, I think, solid, um, stimulating days of presentations and uh, discussions. Uh, and although I have actually thanked everyone else, everyone I need to thank at the beginning of the conference, let me just uh, thank one group of heroes uh, one more time. And, uh, you know, most of us who attend these kinds of events, we, we imagine that uh, uh, everything falls into place on the day itself, right? Like the proverbial tree, you know, that nobody knows falls in the forest and therefore uh, does not exist, right? However, this is really not the truth. Um, things don't just fall into place. Uh, people put them there. Or if they fall out of place, people put them back into place. Uh, and for all of that, all the things we don't see, um, those of us who enjoy these conferences, I want to thank our very wonderful team of student administrators, uh, IT technicians, uh, our administrative staff, uh, they work really, really hard. You, if you can see them right now, they are exhausted. Right? Uh, and they were very, very ably led by um, my faculty colleague, Cherian George, you know, who made sure that every detail was looked into, 
to the best of everyone's ability. So thank you all, you're the true heroes of this uh, conference. Now, uh, you, you remember that at the start of this conference, I made the tongue-in-cheek um, remark that we should treat this conference as a kind of exorcism to summon and expel the ghosts of the Cold War. Uh, at the end of this conference, I'm not entirely sure that we succeeded uh, in doing this, not completely anyway, uh, but perhaps that's a good thing because after all, in the biblical tradition, when you cast out a demon, that demon can often come back with seven others. So on that note, this is Kenneth Paul Khan, uh, wishing you all peace, good health, and goodbye. <laughs>